Hello and welcome. My name is Dr. Elizabeth Ortiz. I'm so happy you have found your way here. I am a rheumatologist with over 15 years of experience and I love helping people make the health decisions that are best for them. There is a lot of information out there on the interwebs and I aim to pass along practical information that will help you as you face your autoimmune, inflammatory, or rheumatic condition. Today we are talking about osteoporosis. It's very common and if not attended to, can lead to a lot of preventable problems. So let's get into it. First off, let me just clarify that osteoporosis is not osteoarthritis. Osteoarthritis is a degenerative type of arthritis. It's the wear and tear that we get in our joints. Osteoporosis is the weakening of our bones that puts us at risk for fractures. I've seen a lot of people who get confused by this because the names are similar and they both involve the bone. But osteoarthritis is a joint problem and osteoporosis is a bone problem. Now, I've got other videos you can check out if you hit this by accident and are actually inter interested in osteoarthritis. Okay, so what is osteoporosis? Well, like I said, it's a condition of bone weakness that puts us at risk of bone fractures. Our bones are an intricate architecture of different types of cells that serve as the strong base for which our muscles, tendons, and ligaments attach. When those bones get weak, they can break, even from the mildest of trauma. A broken arm, leg, or wrist is one thing, but when we get osteoporosis, we're at risk of broken vertebrae in our back or broken hips. Both things can lead to just more medical issues, especially as we get older. Now, why do we get osteoporosis and who is most at risk? Well, the problem is in the balance between bone formation and bone breakdown. There are specific cell types within our bones whose job it is to build up bone and whose job it is to break it down. We require a nice balance between these two forces to keep our skeletal system strong. When the balance gets tipped too far towards bone breakdown, the cells who build bone can't keep up and our bones end up getting weaker. So why does the scale get tipped toward bone breakdown? Well, it depends on who you are. Classically, we have thought of osteoporosis as a condition of postmenopausal women. And this is because it was found very early on that the loss of estrogen that happens during menopause bends the balance towards bone breakdown and thus we get osteoporosis. Because of this, osteoporosis is one of the very few conditions in which the majority of research has been done in women and not men. However, anyone can get osteoporosis. In fact, it's estimated that about a third of our osteoporotic fractures within the U.S. happen in men. Now, there are many reasons why someone may develop osteoporosis. We've talked about one of them being a woman. The other is being older. So 20% of women over the age of 50 and 30% of those over the age of 65 are going to meet criteria for osteoporosis. The next is a low body weight. And I'm talking about less than 120 pounds. Obviously, that's dependent on a lot of factors. But it's important to note that we in the medical community are usually always shouting out about the risks of a high body weight. Well, in the case of osteoporosis, it's actually low body weight that we're most concerned with. Being white, Asian, or Hispanic, it's gonna put you at higher risk. And having low estrogen, like I mentioned with menopause. But there's actually a lot of different reasons why someone might have low estrogen. It might be from medications, it might be from medical conditions, or it might be from surgery. All of them will result in low estrogen that can then result in osteoporosis. Speaking of medications, prednisone is a huge cause of osteoporosis, specifically when someone's been on it for three months or longer. But it's not the only medication. There's a long list of medications that's associated with osteoporosis, including chemotherapy, thyroid hormone, certain antidepressants and anticonvulsants, and even the commonly used protein pump inhibitors or PPIs that we use for heartburn. You can be at higher risk for osteoporosis if you have family members, specifically your parents, who had a hip fracture. Also, if you're currently smoking or drink an excess of alcohol. And then there's a slew of medical conditions that can lead to having a low bone density or osteoporosis. Things like an organ transplant, having a high parathyroid hormone, diabetes, chronic kidney disease, anorexia, bariatric surgery, 
thyroid problems, being immobile, having malabsorption conditions or celiac, the list goes on and on and on. But I do want to have a special shout out to rheumatoid arthritis. Those with rheumatoid arthritis have a particularly high risk of developing osteoporosis. So how can you tell if you have it? Well, osteoporosis in and of itself does not cause pain. In fact, it usually doesn't cause any symptoms unless someone develops a fracture, in which case the symptoms are simply the pain from that fracture. So because there are no symptoms, we have to proactively screen for it. So how do we do that? Well, when someone is deemed to be high risk, they can undergo a bone mineral density scan or a DEXA scan. This is a very easy scan to do. You just lay there, there's no tube to go through. It's super fast and easy. The scan is looking at your spine and your hips. In some cases, we'll look at your forearm, but for the most part, we're focusing on your lumbar spine or your low back and either one or both of your hips. The scan's gonna provide density measurements of different parts of the bone and then compare that to an average that's been predetermined. Depending on the age and gender of the person getting the scan, will determine what set of averages they are compared to. So your bone density numbers are compared to predetermined averages and then it spits out a score. And now this can be a T-score or a Z-score in young people or men. If the T-score is reported as negative 2.5 or less, so we're talking negative 2.6, negative 2.9, negative 3.3, etc., then it's determined that you have osteoporosis. If the T-score is between negative 1.1 and negative 2.4, we label that as osteopenia, which I like to think of as, okay, your bones aren't quite as strong as quote unquote normal, but they aren't as weak as someone with osteoporosis. And finding out you have osteopenia is an excellent opportunity to take advantage of some of the lifestyle factors that we know can help build bone that we're gonna talk about in a minute. Now, side note, I really don't wanna to get too in the weeds with the math of all of this, but just know there is still a lot to be worked out when it comes to osteoporosis in men and young people. Since all the data and number crunching was initially done with women over 65, all the trials looking at medications were done also with those standards. This can create a lot of confusion about the best way to diagnose and approach someone who isn't a woman over 65 with low bone density. Suffice to say, if you fall in that category, have a talk with your doctor about what's best for you. Now, there's another number you may hear about that we use to determine the next steps, and that's the FRAC score. This is simply a number that is calculated utilizing a bunch of data about you. Your age, your family history, whether you smoke, your medical history, and your bone density as measured by the DEXA. Based on all this data, your FRAC score can then calculate what your risk of a fracture is in the next 10 years. If someone has a very high FRAC score, even if their bone density is technically not osteoporosis, so perhaps they have osteopenia, they may still need prescription medication. Because remember, the goal of all of this is to prevent fractures. So I've been talking a lot about fractures. When we're talking about osteoporosis and fractures, we are specifically talking about fragility fractures. A fragility fracture is a fracture that results from a fall of standing height or less. So they would be fractures from events that we wouldn't necessarily consider that big of a deal. You fall from a ladder? Sure. It would be expected you may fracture something. You fall from getting up from a chair? That shouldn't cause anything to break. If someone develops a fragility fracture, especially of the spine, the hip, forearm, humerus, or pelvis, then they are automatically diagnosed with osteoporosis and a DEXA is just done to document their bone density starting point. We can then use that as a baseline to compare after treatment is started, which is an excellent opportunity to now talk about how do we treat osteoporosis? Obviously, if someone has suffered a fragility fracture, then they need to see an orthopedic surgeon and talk about surgical options for the fracture, but that won't do anything for the underlying reason the fracture happened in the first place. When we think about treatment, the primary goal is preventing fractures. We do this with medications and lifestyle changes, and we'll use a DEXA scan as a tool to help us risk stratify, because we know certain DEXA scores are associated with high and low risk of fractures. So what can we do before medications? Well, let's start with what everyone should be doing, which is making some lifestyle changes that are going to support bone building and prevent falls. So number one, stop smoking and decrease your alcohol use. I know, it's like no fun. 
You also want to increase your weight bearing exercise. Now, side note, this is exactly why astronauts get osteoporosis. Without gravity to have to push through, their muscles don't work as hard as they do here on Earth, thus they develop osteoporosis. Now, to prevent falls, you wanna look around your house. You wanna make sure that if you have any dark corners or areas that you can't quite see the floor, that you illuminate that with some night lights. You also wanna make sure you don't have any rugs with corners that are easy to trip on and you wanna limit the number of steps you have both in your house and outside your house. Now, let's get into the supplements, what everyone always asks about. How much calcium should you be taking? We well, wanna get in about 1,000 to 1,200 milligrams of calcium a day, but preferably this should be from your diet. Now, if you have any questions about what foods are high in calcium, I'm gonna have a link in the description box below that's got some great information. We also have vitamin D. Now I have a whole video on vitamin D as it's a hot, super interesting, sexy topic in the world of autoimmunity. And in that video, I talk about vitamin D's role in the immune system and what your goal vitamin D intake should be. That's talking with the mindset of autoimmunity. If we're talking about just bone health, then we know that you need a vitamin D level of at least 30. And to get there, most people need 400 to 1,000 units a day. Now, another thing to note, many of the prescription medications that we use for osteoporosis can cause your calcium levels to drop very low. It's because of this that it's absolutely imperative that everyone, even if you're looking at prescription medication, also make sure they're getting enough calcium and vitamin D either through their diet or through supplements. All right, so let's talk about some of the medications. Well, the two most commonly used medications are the class of medication called bisphosphonates and the medication denosumab. So bisphosphonates is usually recommended as the initial treatment, and we've been using these medications for many, many years. As I said, this is a class of medications, so examples of a bisphosphonate include alendronate, ibandronate, zolendronate, you can probably see the similarities with the names. Now these medications can be oral, they can be an infusion, or they can be an injection. All are very effective, although oral bisphosphonates are notorious for causing GI upset with nausea and heartburn symptoms. If this happens to you, you can easily be switched to an IV or an injectable version. Now these medications are very effective, but likely should not be used forever, as long-term use can be associated with jawbone problems or atypical or weird femur fractures. How long you should be on this medication without a break should be discussed with your doctor when you're starting it. Now that other medication I mentioned was denosumab. This is a very effective alternative to bisphosphonates that doesn't have the same GI effects and doesn't seem to be as strongly associated with jaw or other fracture problems. However, this seems to be a medication that one would need to be on lifelong as stopping the medication can lead the bone density to drop again, again raising your fracture risk. There are a few other medications that can be used in osteoporosis that are used in specific situations and usually under the care of an endocrinologist or rheumatologist. Now, depending on who you are and what kind of doctor you are seeing, your doctor may be aggressive about osteoporosis or may not mention it at all. In rheumatology, many of our inflammatory conditions either bring with them an increased risk of osteoporosis or require prednisone, which can lead to it. Yet I'd be lying if I said that rooms did a great job across the board at getting into this. This is why I want you to bring it up. If you are a woman over 50 who have gone through menopause already, ask your doctor if you should have a DEXA scan. If you are someone with an autoimmune condition, regardless of whether you have been on steroids, ask your doctor about your risk and if you need a DEXA scan. Or if you're someone who has been on prednisone for longer than three months, ask your doctor about your risk and if you need a DEXA scan. Spoiler alert, the answer is yes to all of these. If you've already been diagnosed with osteoporosis and are either already on medications or are thinking about starting, I recommend talking with your doctor about how long you will need to be on them. What are the markers you're going to use that will signal you can come off? How frequently do you need a DEXA scan? What are the risks of staying on the medication too long? And what's the risk of coming off of it too soon? I always recommend having a conversation about ending a medicine when you are starting it. Even if the answer is, sorry, dude, this medication's forever, best to know that upfront and to know why. 
So I hope this has been helpful. You know, osteoporosis isn't always the sexiest of topics, but it's one that's super important. The last thing we need to be dealing with is a fracture and knowing what you can do about it before it happens so that it doesn't happen is really key. If you like this video, it really helps if you like and subscribe, share this with anyone you think could benefit from this information. Like I said, my goal here is to provide some practical, up-to-date information so that you can make the best health decisions for you. Thanks, and we'll see you next time.